us today, Mark Rowe, uh, who's going to give uh, the seminar. So Mark got his Master's of Science and his PhD in Environmental Engineering from Michigan Tech. Uh, he became a research fellow at the Cooperative Institutes of Limnology and Ecosystems Research a few years back. Uh, and was just so darn good that the University of Michigan said, we've got to hire him on as an assistant research scientist, uh, which he's been at Michigan uh, since 2015. Um, he has expertise in a wide variety of topics, but all of um, his expertise revolves, I think, around uh, biophysical modeling. So bringing together physical models with biological models to try to predict biological phenomena. He's worked on uh, uh, pollution uh, in the Great Lakes, modeling its, uh, its spread. Uh, more recently, he's worked on the physics of harmful algal blooms, trying to modify physical models to account for realistic biology so that we can improve our predictions. Uh, he's been modeling the impacts of invasive species in the Great Lakes uh, by linking biological models to hydrodynamic models. Uh, and then most recently, he took lead and was awarded a $1.5 million grant from NCOS uh, to develop forecasts that predict the location and movement of hypoxic zones in Lake Erie. And I think that's what he's going to talk about today, probably presenting some of the preliminary results uh, from that, as well as the, the concepts they're going to be addressing in that new grant. He's going to be talking at looking at Lake Erie hypoxia from a different point of view. Mark. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Brad, and thanks everybody to, for attending and for those of you who tuned in online. So as Brad mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a new project that we're beginning that will have a focus on nearshore episodic events of hypoxia. And in this presentation, so I'm going to talk about some background and some preliminary results and put it in the context of uh, the previous literature in the area and try to give kind of a general picture of what we know now about these nearshore episodic events of hypoxia and what we hope to learn through this project going forward. So if I can get the slide to advance. I'll start with a little background. So a theme that will be carried throughout this presentation are two factors that are required to develop hypoxia in lakes. The first one being biochemical oxygen demand and the second one being stratification of the water column. So biochemical oxygen demand results from decay of organic matter and the resulting uptake of oxygen. And it's a natural process, but it can be amplified through eutrophication as illustrated in this graphic. So when we add nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus to a lake, for example, from fertilizer runoff or from uh, wastewater. That stimulates algal growth, which produces biomass, which can settle down to the bottom, and as it decays, it takes up oxygen. So moving on to the second factor, if the water column is vertically well mixed, then that oxygen can be replaced by exchange from the atmosphere. But if the water column is stratified, as often happens in lakes in the summer, if they're deep enough, then the bottom water is cut off from exchange with the atmosphere and given enough time and sufficient biochemical oxygen demand, the oxygen can be depleted. So hypoxia has some important ecological impacts. So it kills benthic organisms that are an important food source for fish. It can exclude certain types of fish from their preferred habitats. And if the fish can't uh, move or get away from it, it can result in fish kills. So these two factors will be carried through the presentation, uh, the first factor being mainly biological and the second factor being mainly physical uh, causes of hypoxia. So much of the research on hypoxia in Lake Erie and on hypoxia in general has been directed toward answering the question, how much would we have to reduce nutrient loads in order to eliminate hypoxia or reduce it to an acceptable level? And that answer or that question has been recently answered in a comprehensive manner for Lake Erie by a group of experts that was convened under the auspices of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And so they brought together all the data and all the various models that have been applied to simulate hypoxia in Lake Erie. And this figure is from their report, which shows 
um, hypoxic area in Lake Erie as a function of total phosphorus load. And each line in this figure represents a different hypoxia model for Lake Erie. And they came up with a recommendation to reduce the phosphorus load to Lake Erie by 40% and that that would reduce uh, both harmful algal blooms and hypoxia to a reasonable level. And so the states and province of Ontario are in the process of developing plans to uh, bring about that recommended reduction in phosphorus loads. So we can hope to see uh, the root causes of this issue addressed, and we can hope to see a reduction in hypoxia in the future. However, it's likely that these changes will take some years to take effect, so at least for uh, you know, coming years, we don't know exactly how long, we may still see hypoxia occurring in Lake Erie. So aside from the important ecological impacts, hypoxia also has an influence on public water systems that draw their water from Lake Erie. So public water systems located along the shoreline uh, report being affected by episodes of hypoxia. And this might be somewhat surprising because we often think of hypoxia as being mainly associated with uh, the deeper portions of the central basin. So just point with my mouse pointer there to the 20 meter contour. So we often think of the hypoxia being mainly within the, that 20 meter contour. But apparently these near shore episodes of hypoxia do occur, although they've been studied to a lesser extent. So that's something that we'll have an opportunity to investigate further through this project going forward. So this project that we have is to develop an operational Lake Erie hypoxia forecasting system for public water systems decision support. So I'm working on this with a team of researchers from the University of Michigan Siler and from NOAA Glural. And we have collaborators from the Cleveland Division of Water and Purdue University, US Geological Survey, and Limnotech. So the goal of this project is to develop a model that can forecast episodes of hypoxia at water intakes on Lake Erie, and that's suitable for transition to operational use at NOAA. So this latter part, uh, suitable for transition to operational use at NOAA, introduces some additional constraints that are different from some of the previous hypoxia modeling projects that um, had more of a research orientation and toward addressing the question that I mentioned at the beginning of the proposal. So uh, one of the constraints is that we would like this model to be linked to the Lake Erie Operational Forecasting System, which I will mention a little bit later here. And a second constraint is that we'd like the model to be as simple as possible while still accomplishing the goal of making a useful forecast. And the reason being that in an operational setting, the model would have to be reinitialized, updated, and run every 24 hours. So the more complex the model is, the more different types of data that have to go into it, the more challenging it would be to run and maintain a model in an operational setting. So in this project, we're going to pursue uh, both relatively simple physically based models and more complex uh, biogeochemical, more conventional water quality type model. And this is somewhat of a novel application. So by pursuing these two different types of models, we'll see which one best accomplishes the goal. So now let's take a look at the phenomenon that we're uh, hoping to forecast. So in this 2008 paper by Steve Ruberg and others, um, he worked with Cleveland Water Division to help define this problem that is uh, affecting the water intakes. So in these figures from the paper, we can see time series of water quality variables at one of the Cleveland water intakes. And we can see that there's an episode where over a few days, the temperature, pH, and dissolved oxygen uh, decrease and then over the coming few days increase again. So when this type of event happens at the water intake, the water plant managers have to respond by making adjustments to their treatment processes in order to ensure uh, the continued quality of the treated water. So if they have advanced notice of events like this occurring, they could prepare by uh, being appropriately vigilant in terms of monitoring, having the right people on hand, having the right supplies in place, in place so that they'll be prepared to uh, respond to these events. So since 2005, Glural partnered with uh, Cleveland Division of Water to install and maintain a buoy with a sensor package 
located about 15 miles north of Cleveland in the central basin of Lake Erie, in order to provide real-time monitoring of dissolved oxygen at the bottom of Lake Erie. And this information was distributed through uh, Laurel's website called the Hypoxia Warning System. So this is useful in terms of showing whether or not there's hypoxia out in Lake Erie that might affect water intakes. But still, it doesn't provide a forecast of when and where the intakes might be affected. But it's interesting to look at all the years of data from this buoy, which we can see in this figure. Um, so we have data for 2005 through 2016. And just by taking a quick look at that, at this, we can see that the development of hypoxia differs quite a bit from one year to the next in terms of the timing of the onset at this location. Could occur in July, could occur in August, or even in September. And then at the end of the season, um, hypoxia suddenly ends at some point, although it may return in some years, such as in 2014 and 15, after it suddenly ends, then it comes back. So these are the types of events that we'd like to be able to predict. And we know that they're driven by uh, dynamic movements of water in the lake and by the thermal structure in the lake. So something else that's new in 2016 was that NOAA upgraded their Lake Erie operational forecasting system model. So the previous model was based on the Princeton Ocean model. It had a five kilometer structured grid and 10 vertical layers. And there was also a two kilometer version of this model that was run at Glural, but this five kilometer version was the operational model at NOAA. So that operational model was upgraded to a model that was based on FVCOM, the finite volume community ocean model, it uses an unstructured grid. And the unstructured grid has some advantages in terms of representing nearshore areas. So the unstructured grid can use increased spatial resolution in areas of interest. For example, if I can find my little mouse pointer. So near the Lake Erie Islands, have increased resolution in this model. And then also there can be increased spatial resolution in the near shore. And an additional advantage is that the unstructured grid can more faithfully represent complex coastline geometries. Whereas in the structured grid, the coastline was represented in sort of a sawtooth manner that wasn't very realistic. So there's hope that this model could produce a more realistic representation of the dynamics in near shore areas. But most of the um, validation and skill assessment for the model to date has focused on um, data from offshore locations. So in this project, we'll have an opportunity to more thoroughly evaluate how this model does in nearshore areas. So this figure shows um, improved simulation of subsurface thermal structure in the updated model. So a common issue with uh, numerical hydrodynamic models is that they tend to have a more diffuse representation of the thermocline than exists in reality. So on the right, we can see that the updated FVCOM model was able to maintain a sharper thermocline than the previous Princeton Ocean model. So that's promising in terms of being able to simulate development of hypoxia. So an important variable in hypoxia is the thickness of the hypolimnion. So a thin hypolimnion can be depleted of oxygen more quickly than a thick one. So that's one of the key variables in the development of hypoxia. And so it's important to be able to accurately simulate the subsurface thermal structure. And so this is a, something that we'll be able to evaluate in greater detail in this project. So something else that we did for the first time in 2016 was to provide some model data on the Laurel's Hypoxia Warning System website. So with the new model, we provided some graphics that showed a forecast of the bottom water temperature in Lake Erie. So uh, this set of graphics appeared on the website on the 26th of August last summer. And so I'll just use my mouse pointer here to show this area along the southern shoreline where you can see the red color, which is indicating warm water from the surface mixed layer in contact with the bottom. So we'd expect that water to be oxygenated as well. And then seven days later, on the 3rd of September, 
we see that the cold bottom water has moved closer to the shoreline. And so it was an actual forecast at the time, seven days into the future. And then here at the bottom, so this graphic shows vertical profiles of temperature in the water column so over time. And again, the seven-day forecast showing uh, an upwelling event happening, happening at this location, which is close to the Cleveland water intake. So that's a forecast that's potentially useful in itself, although it's somewhat qualitative because, all, because it only simulates temperature. So although it's showing that this cold water, which might be hypoxic, is coming closer to the water intakes, it's not really providing a quantitative forecast. So we'd like to be able to do a more of a quantitative forecast. But um, now looking back in retrospect, we can see what was actually happening at the water intakes during this upwelling event. So something else that was new in 2016 was that Limnotech and Gloss had installed uh, sensors for temperature and dissolved oxygen at several new locations in Lake Erie that were close to water intakes. Um, this, this buoy here was close to the Cleveland water intake, and then the rest of these were near the, uh, um, actually inside the pump stations at additional water intakes. So looking first here at the tops, this is the early warning system buoy again. And then these blue lines here, this is the period of this upwelling event that was forecast. So we can see that the dissolved oxygen is gradually declining. The hypoxia exists at the offshore buoy at this time, but nothing in particular is happening at the time of that forecast upwelling event. Now if we look at the buoy that's located close to the Cleveland water intake. So the development of hypoxia at this location is quite different than the location further offshore. So see that hypoxia initiated in um, early in July as opposed to a month later in August at the more offshore location. And we can also see that there's some dynamic events happening here in September with sudden interruptions in the hypoxia. And then, now moving on to the actual water intakes. So this sensor was in the pump station at the Ashtabula water intake, which is located uh, quite close to shore, really. And so we can see that there was an episode of hypoxia that happened here at this water intake that was associated with this upwelling event. And so moving from east to west, so this is the intake at Mentor. And we can see an episode of hypoxia happening there as well. And then water intake at Nottingham. So this is one of the one of the Cleveland water intakes. We can see this is located in a little bit deeper water than the other ones, closer to the thermocline. So we see more dynamic changes in the dissolved oxygen at that location. And there is an event associated with that upwelling. And then finally, the furthest west location at City of Avon Lake. And we can see an uh, event of hypoxia happening there as well. So with this new array of sensors, we can see what was actually happening at the time that, that upwelling event was forecast. So again, we'd like to be able to forecast dissolved oxygen as well as temperature. So let's see if I can get this slide to advance again. So we set up a relatively simple uh, physically based dissolved oxygen model. So as I mentioned, we're going to pursue both relatively simple and complex models. This one here at a first attempt is the probably the simplest version. So this model we set up to have two state variables, dissolved oxygen and reduced substances, where reduced substances represents reduced substances that would diffuse out of the sediment as oxygen equivalents. That would represent things like ammonium, methane, sulfides, reduced iron, and manganese. And so in terms of processes, this model represents exchange of oxygen with the atmosphere, uh, water column, oxygen demand, sediment oxygen demand, and this diffusion of reduced substances. And it's also linked to the Lake Erie Operational Forecasting System, so it's simulating uh, three-dimensional advection and diffusion of transport. So this model basically has 
three parameters, which in the simplest version we're going to set up as being just constant in space and time. So the water column, oxygen demand, sediment oxygen demand, and this diffusion flux of reduced substances. So we need to come up with values for those parameters. And uh, those of you who were at the Agler conference last year might remember that uh, this paper was presented as one of the keynote addresses. So here this is showing this aerial hypolimnetic mineralization rate, which is related to the average rate of oxygen consumption over the season for several lakes in Switzerland that this group studied. And so they found that, um, now these are all eutrophic lakes, so for eutrophic lakes, there was a predictable relationship here as a function of the hypolimnian thickness. So lake area wasn't included in their data set that we could put it on there just based on its hypolimnian thickness. And we can come up with this value of 0.7 for this uh, hypolimnetic mineralization rate. And so that, that's actually quite similar to values that uh, have been measured independently for Lake Erie. Now, in addition, in this paper, they measured this flux of reduced substances for uh, all these different lakes. And they found that it was fairly consistent for eutrophic lakes uh, from lake to lake, and that it was uh, also the same as the intercept on this plot. So that's two parameters for our model. And so for the third parameter, we could look at this paper by Dan Rusinski and others, where they used a similar physically-based dissolved oxygen model, except theirs was a one-dimensional uh, vertical column model. And they set their sediment oxygen demand to a value of 0.7, same value I mentioned earlier, and they calibrated their model using this water column oxygen demand as a calibration parameter, coming up with different values for each year based on the rate of oxygen consumption that was measured over time for that. And so they also found that, at least after 1994, that this water column oxygen demand was correlated to the phosphorus load to Lake Erie. So that gives some hope that this might be a predictable parameter. And so for our model simulation here, I just took a value for this based on the more recent years from that figure. And so then we ran our model. And so now we can plot our model results on the same figure that I showed earlier at these locations in Lake Erie. So here, the uh, black lines is the same, same data that I showed you earlier, and the red lines are from the model. And again, the blue lines here are this upwelling event that we saw earlier. So looking first at this offshore buoy from the early warning system, you can see that the model captured the rate of decline in dissolved oxygen pretty well just by setting the parameter values based on the literature, as I described. And looking at the more near shore buoy location, we can see that the model also simulated the earlier onset of hypoxia at that location in July versus in August at the further offshore location. And then looking at the water intakes, which are mostly located very near shore, we can see that in the upwelling event, so at Ashtabula, the model did show an event happening at that time, although it was underpredicted. At Mentor, the model did a pretty good job of capturing that event. At Nottingham, the model also captured an event there of similar magnitude. And then also at Avon Lake, it simulated that event reasonably well. So now, looking out over the rest of the season, we see that the model hits some events and it misses others. So um, there's more work to be done, and we will work on improving that model as the project goes on. But for such a simple model, these uh, preliminary results are encouraging. So now we can look at some of the spatial patterns of hypoxia in Lake Erie that came out of the model simulation. So looking at July, we can see that the model indicated that the hypoxia initiated in nearshore areas along the southern shoreline. And so that was consistent with the observations that we saw from the nearshore buoy, which is around here, and then the offshore buoy out here that showed later onset of hypoxia. So there's at least some observations to confirm that. But we don't really know whether the model is accurate in these areas because we don't really have observations there at this time. 
but as so as the season progresses, the model showed um, hypoxia moving from the near shore, uh, filling in offshore, and then towards the end of the season, as the surface mix layer gets deeper and deeper and contacts more of the bottom, then that causes the hypoxia to retreat to deeper and deeper locations. So how realistic are these spatial patterns of hypoxia? So let's look at um, some of the literature on this question. So here's another paper that was recent. This is a modeling study by Sergei Boknayov and others. And so they also found that hypoxia was initiating um, near shore in their model and moving offshore. And they presented this as a novel result saying that um, despite a widespread belief that lake area hypoxia starts at the deepest parts of the basin, our results present the first numerical demonstration that both hypoxia and anoxia start in the near shore and move out. Um, although they didn't have observations in the near shore to test their model in that particular case. So where would this perception have come from that hypoxia starts in the deepest parts of the lake first? So here's another paper. Um, this is perhaps the most recent comprehensive attempt to estimate the spatial distribution of hypoxia in Lake Erie. Um, this paper focused on the offshore survey stations from US EPA and Environment Canada. And all these stations are located in uh, greater than 20 meters of water, so the deepest parts of the central basin. So they produce these um, estimated maps of hypoxia for um, each year for which there were data in the surveys. So this study was useful for showing uh, trends in hypoxia across years, but it can't really tell us much about nearshore hypoxia because they didn't have observations in the nearshore, and they also didn't have observations in the earlier part of the season in July, where we were seeing some of this nearshore hypoxia initiating in the model. So while this study is interesting and useful, it doesn't tell uh, the full story. So let me get my slide to advance again. So here's another study that focused on um, nearshore hypoxia. So in this study, Richard Krauss and others um, did some surveys. So these colored figures on the right here, this would be just a snapshot in time showing August 2011, they were finding some hypoxia around the 15 meter contour in this location near Fairfield Harbor in Ohio, near Fairport. <coughs> And then in 2013, the hypoxia was a little bit further offshore. And they also put out data loggers between the uh, 15 and 20 meter contours in Lake Erie. So their shallowest location was this 13.8 meter station. And so they found in the red line on this figure um, that they were seeing hypoxia at that location and that it was quite dynamic and episodic. So this is the kind of rapid variation in water quality parameters that would be frustrating for water intake managers. So here's another study that included some near shore stations. This was from the 2005 International Field Year of the Great Lakes. So they had some near shore stations in the September survey which were showing some hypoxia, although it's a little bit hard to tell from this spatial interpolation. But the blue extending out to these locations suggests that there was low dissolved oxygen at these locations. So they also put out data loggers and there was an interesting finding here which was that the first stations to go hypoxic were these stations 9 and 13 which are located in relatively deep parts of the <coughs> central basin. So that might at first seem contradictory to the hypothesis that hypoxia starts near shore and moves offshore. But if we think of it rather than nearshore versus offshore, if we think of it in terms of the thickness of the hypolimnion, then it could make sense if the hypolimnion was actually thinner at that location than elsewhere. So in this paper by Bolesky and others, um, so they found that there was evidence that the hypolimnion was actually thinner at those locations. So they applied a model to um, that same year, 2005, of the Eiffel study. And so they showed that 
the uh, hypolimnion or the, uh, the thermocline is not actually flat, but it's curved. And they, so they showed that the uh, hypolimnion was thinner in the eastern part of the central basin than in the western part, and there were some observations to confirm that as well. So this is an interesting finding in this paper that the thermocline is not flat but curved, and it can be either concave or convex. And in this paper, they showed with their model simulations that the shape of the thermocline is driven by uh, vorticity in the circulation patterns, which itself is driven by vorticity in the wind fields. So they showed that it was really important to have accurate depictions of the wind fields in the forcings to the model. So this is something that uh, we'll be able to investigate further in this project as well. So I've made the case that we don't totally understand what the spatial and temporal distribution of hypoxia is in Lake Erie. And in this project, we'll have an opportunity to do some field work to further investigate that. So we're planning to install moorings at eight locations in Lake Erie. Um, four of those locations will be in relatively near shore locations um, in the vicinity of water intakes. Four of those locations are going to be distributed around the central basin. And these moorings will have temperature and dissolved oxygen sensors at multiple levels. So we'll be able to see um, that three-dimensional shape, the curvature of the thermocline. And we'll be able to see um, the three-dimensional shape and dynamics of the hypoxic area in the lake. So in addition to the moorings, we will also measure currents and we'll measure the sediment and water column oxygen demand to better constrain those parameters in the model. And if I can just advance to my last slide. So in summary, uh, the spatial and temporal extent of hypoxia is variable and not well known. So physical variables influence episodes of nearshore hypoxia, including the hypolimnion thickness, which is an important driver of how long it takes to develop hypoxia, the meteorological forcings and circulation patterns in the lake. Spatial and temporal variability of the biochemical oxygen demand may also be important, but we have relatively few observations. So that's, we're also developing this biophysical dissolved oxygen model, which could hope to better simulate that spatial, those spatial patterns of the biochemical oxygen demand. And Finally, improved models and increased monitoring of nearshore hypoxia will improve our understanding and predictive ability, which is of interest to public water systems. So thanks for your attention. All right. Thanks, Mark. That was excellent. Um, we are going to have some time for questions, but I'm told that we need to pass around the microphone for those who have questions so that people who are online can hear uh, your question as well as Mark's response. Does anybody want to get us started? Brent? One of the early slides showed a uh, temperature profile with time measured at, at some point, and it seemed to have sort of a sawtooth pattern on the bottom of the thermocline that I'm tempted, tempted to in interpret as an internal sash. Do like you have that. any idea where? Uh, now, I, I remember the, the slide had um, a header that seemed to say that it was from the Glural website. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's earlier in your talk. Really? Yeah, this one, the, the, the figure at the bottom. Uh-huh. Um, so it has that sawtooth at the bottom. I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any idea whether that interacts yeah. with hypoxia so that yeah this pattern here so that seems to be like the 18 hour period of the near inertial oscillations of the thermocline so so yeah if there's a vertical gradient so the water's kind of moving up and down you know in that pattern so if there's a vertical gradient in temperature or a vertical gradient in dissolved oxygen or any other variable um, as that moves across the fixed site, then you'll see oscillations in, in those variables as well. 
So you can see that same 18 hour period oscillation in some of the water quality um, water quality plots as well. Next question. Mark, I'm wondering if there are any drinking water intakes on the Canadian side of Lake Erie? Um, I assume that there are. <laughs> and if so, I mean, do you see any opportunity to work with managers there across the border um, with the forecast model? Yes, I do. If any of them want to contact us or get in touch, uh, we'd be interested in working with them as well. Okay, great, thanks. Mark, I have a question, a naive one as a biologist. So I've worked a lot with uh, climate change modelers, uh, sort of modeling or forecasting carbon fluxes. Uh, many of them have backgrounds in physics or some form of environmental engineering, and to them, biology is a black box. There's either a forest or there's not a forest. Um, the levels of biological organization are pretty crude, which leads me to a question. If one were to unpack the black box here, and actually think about what is the variation in the organic matter being decomposed, or more likely the variation in the organisms who are doing the decomposition, how much do you think it would tighten up the variation between the model predictions and the actual observations uh, to unpack, unpack that biological black box? Yeah, that's a good question. And so we can never fully unpack the biological box because <laughs> the complexity is essentially infinite. But we can go to various levels in unpacking that box. And um, so as we know with the, the biophysical models, um, there are models of varying levels of the complexity that represent um, either more groups of organisms or fewer, more biological processes or biogeochemical processes or fewer. So that is a fundamental question that we have to deal with in these types of modeling studies is how far do we want to go in the complexity? So in this particular study, since we have a fairly well-defined objective, which is to predict these hypoxic events at water intakes, so we're going to take the approach of starting with the simplest model and then adding complexity as we need to to see if it helps us you know, improve our forecast. So yeah, it's a good question, and it's, it's something that we're definitely going to have to deal with. But your first start wouldn't necessarily be to put out DNA chips to monitor the microbial community? <laughs> well, so as far as the microbial community, you know, very few of the biogeochemical water quality models would actually represent different types of, you know, bacteria. Yeah. So, yeah, we usually represent them in terms of their effects. Just to add to the conversation there, um, it's not fully looking at the biological differences that are causing the differences in rates, but we will be assessing uh, sediment oxygen demand and water column oxygen demand rates uh, at different seasons and different spatial locations so that we can you know, sort of tease apart if there's obvious differences to, you know, the amount of organic matter produced and the timing of when it's produced and, and reaching the bottom. So we'll compare, you know, early season and late season and then three different habitats that might have different depositional characteristics. So we'll, we'll be able to tease apart a little bit of the biology influence on um, the SOD parameter. Thanks for clarifying that, Tom. Just a uh, comment about the Princeton Ocean model, the palm in the Lake Erie. The resolution is two kilometer, and the vertical layer is uh, 20 layer. Uh, and the another thing about the uh, if we can the sea is standard for community, not coast. Yes. <laughs> right. So yeah, there was. Yeah, as I was told, there are two different versions of the POM model. So the one that was run operationally at NOAA was a five kilometer, and the one that was run at Glural was the two kilometer model that you're describing. Other questions or comments? <laughs>
All right, that was super cool, important work, and a really great example of how uh, NOAA data and uh, research can meet the needs of society. So join me once again in thanking Mark for a nice seminar. Thanks, everyone.